So this video talks about the idea of judgment and considers two different ways to think about what makes for good judgment, um, whether we're thinking about accuracy or whether we're thinking about the consequences. And I wanna lay out kind of what is going on with that. And for this conversation, I'm gonna be drawing pretty heavily on Phil Tetlock's book, Super Forecasters, which I very much encourage everybody to go out and read. It's a, it's a, it's a well-written book uh, and it does some really interesting social science in which Tetlock um, runs for years these forecasting competitions in which people are making predictions about all sorts of things and then he looks at sort of who gets it right and who gets it wrong and figures out what sort of attributes are associated with people who do forecasting really really well and so again i think it's a it's a useful book and he talks a little, little bit about sort of what constitutes a good forecaster and maybe how you can build some of those skills so before we jump in here i want to highlight an important distinction um this is similar to what I've talked about with critical thinking about sort of a typology of questions you might ask, but I think it's worth differentiating between a forecast or a prediction, which is going to be about the future from an analysis or an assessment, which is a, a question about sort of the way the world is today in the present. And when you're making a, a assessment or an analysis, it's possible to actually get the facts and know for certain. There's certainly going to be un you know, unknowns. You may not have all the data you want. You may have to wrestle with denial and deception and things that would make it difficult to know how to reconcile competing information. But in theory, it's possible to get to an actual conclusion using the data and using evidence and doing sort of inductive reasoning. You might continue to use theory. You might continue to use deductive reasoning to kind of fill in the gaps, but in theory, most of what you're getting can be based on, on evidence. With forecasting, that's not the way the world works. There's no way that we can actually know what the future looks like. Um, so uncertainty is inherent. And there's no data for us to collect. We are oftentimes forced to rely solely on theory, uh, whether we're doing that you know, formally and in a sort of a conscious way, or whether we're doing it sort of informally with our gut, we're always making sort of an inference about the future using ideas about how we think the world actually works. And so I think it's worth highlighting before we go any further that these are two fundamentally different types of problems and you may need different kinds of skills to tackle these two different kinds of problems. Well, again, that's the discussion of critical thinking and taxonomies um, that kind of highlights this important distinction. Okay, so we'll talk about how to tell if somebody is doing a good job or a bad job uh, with forecasting or prediction. And Tetlock suggests that we should think about what makes a good forecast in terms of baseline probabilities. So if something is incredibly unlikely to happen and I predict that it will happen, that's really impressive. If something is almost certain to happen in terms of baseline probabilities, like the sun rises in the east, if I forecast for you tomorrow the sun will rise in the east, that's not a particularly impressive forecast because the baseline probability is one. It, it will happen, right? Barring the end of our solar system, right? The sun is going to rise in the east tomorrow. Uh, and I don't get any credit for making that particular forecast, right? So the value of our forecast, the quality of our forecast has to be interpreted in terms of those, the likelihood of an event happening just naturally. Okay, so is it a rare event? Is it a common event? Okay, so then the other part of this is our ability to see things before others. And so good judgment, according to Tetlock, is seeing things clearly and correctly, so accurate, um, but to do that before it becomes conventional wisdom. Whereas bad judgment is everybody else has already figured out where things are going and you still don't see it. Right? You are belatedly recognizing what's going on. And you know, on the surface, that might be like hard to kind of figure out whether you're doing a good job or a bad job at, at your forecasts, um, because we don't necessarily know what the conventional wisdom is, but that's where Tetlock's um, sort of good judgment open project comes in, where they ran these competitions and people sort of join in and make forecasts about all sorts of things, and you can kind of aggregate them. Uh, and so this is a question about will you know the Venezuelan opposition leader uh, 
be detained, right, between a certain period of time. And initially people seem to be uncertain, about 50%, and then there's maybe an event that spikes it up to around 80%, but then pretty quickly um, people are back down to 50%, and over time as we close in on the end of, you know, the, the forecast window of January 2021, um, that sort of sense starts declining down, and in fact you, you don't have the, the uh, Juan Gildaro detained. Um, and so if you are recognizing that and you're putting your probabilities at 10% or 20% early on, you are doing better than the crowd. If you're getting into December and you're still convinced 80%, 90% that there will be a detention of the Venezuelan opposition, you're doing a bad job in terms of forecasting because you're, you're not recognizing what the crowd has already come to, to recognize. Okay, so that's a strategy for thinking about what constitutes good judgment or bad judgment. Uh, Tetlock talks a little bit about what makes a person a good forecaster and notes that it's not background, it's not skills, it's not training, it's not education, it's not gender or you know nationality, it's whether or not you approach the problem of forecasting like a fox or like a hedgehog. This is, I, I guess there's story or a fable associated with this, but the basic story is hedgehogs know one thing. Every problem they encounter, they curl up in a ball, they get spiny, and they become a hedgehog that that's how they deal with the world. Foxes, however, are sort of classically clever and, and know lots of tricks. And so foxes, when they encounter a problem, will try different things and tackle it in different ways. Foxes have multiple strategies for working with problems. We could say they have multiple lenses that they can bring to the table, multiple theories, multiple perspectives. Um, foxes tend to look for indicators. They tend to ask for data about trends, uh, kind of figure out how things are, are moving or how they're going. They're willing to listen to other perspectives and get alternative viewpoints and actually consider those in a, in a fair-minded way. And they tend to be less co confident um, in their forecasts. They're, they're less likely to say 100% or 0%. They're more likely to say 95 or 90 or 70 because they're aware of the complexity in the world and that works against overconfidence. Where the hedgehog tends to um, apply the same framework to every problem, tends to push away contradictory data or doesn't want to incorporate new data into the analysis and ends up being highly confident because the hedgehog tends to believe that he or she understands the world uh, and has a good framework and has a good model and has a good approach, curling up in a ball, getting spiny, um, and that complexity and that nuance ends up being a threat to how the hedgehog navigates the world in a way that the hedgehog doesn't want to deal with. So Tetlock tries to go through and classify how people fit as forecasters. Um, this graph is terrible but I'll try to talk through it. So um, on the y-axis, you have improving um, discrimination, whether you able, or whether you're able to get it right or not. So what's your, your probability of success? And then your calibration. So if you say something is gonna be, you know, 70% likely, 70% of the time, do you get that right? Um, and so ideally, right, you would have a fairly good um, discriminant prediction, but you would also, you know, when you're wrong, it would reflect the probability and the uncertainty that you provided around that forecast. And Tetlock looks at a variety of different perspectives about who does well and who does not. He knows that undergrads tend to not do particularly well, um, but they're not alone. Um, he also notes that a whole host of other groups and, and individuals he looked at sort of have this hedgehog kind of technique in terms of how they approach problem solving. And he notes that there are sort of hedge foxes. This is probably where I would classify myself. Maybe I'm a fox hog, I'm not sure, but where I tend to have an ideology or a, a strong theoretical framework that I bring to the table with me. But then I try to counter that. I try to use other perspectives and think about other things. But the short version is that most human beings do really poorly when it comes to forecasting. Uh, I think Tetlock talks about how we're about 7% better than a dart throwing chimp, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, but the best forecasters, right, the, the super forecasters uh, do considerably better. They're about 20% better than a dart throwing chimp, which is kind of encouraging. 
except that when you look at um, mindless competition, whether it's just um, taking trends and mapping them forward, what we may, might call a theoretical models, uh, tomorrow's gonna look exactly like today, or whether it's some sort of formal statistical model where I've um, you know, added in a multiple variables and done a multiple regression and got a, got a forecast that way, those tend to do better uh, than human beings, and in some cases, significantly better than human beings at making forecasts, which is a little disconcerting and suggests that human beings really struggle to do a good job thinking about probabilities, uh, incorporating all the information, and making sound forecasts and judgments. So there's a second way to think about what constitutes a good forecast that isn't related to this idea of accuracy or whether you're calibrated in terms of the probability assessments you put around it. There's a way of thinking about the value of a forecast that's rooted in the consequences of that forecast. Right? And so the way I would maybe think about this is with this sort of two by two table about what I'm, I'm predicting if an event is gonna occur and then whether that event actually occurs. And so if I predict it will happen and it happens, think about a, a, a new pandemic breaking out. I predict it will happen, a new pandemic break, breaks out. Fantastic, I got that right. I feel pretty good about myself. Uh, if there's, If I predict that there will not be a new pandemic, and a new pandemic does not occur. Again, I feel pretty good about myself. I got it right. My forecast, my prediction worked really well. But what happens if I'm wrong? And so if I predict an event and that event doesn't occur, that sets off a false alarm. Um, what Tetlock describes as, um, a, as crying wolf. Uh, versus if I make a prediction that, that a new pandemic is not going to happen and then it happens and I missed that, uh, missing a wolf on the prowl to kind of continue with our analogy of, um, of the boy who cried wolf, what does that mean? And are those two scenarios equivalent? And so what are the consequences, what's likely to happen if I get it wrong? If there's a false alarm, about a pandemic, does that mean that we spend more money than we need to? Does that mean that people are somehow inconvenienced because we do more monitoring? Does it mean that we have to build a new international organization? I don't know what that means, but I should think about like the consequences, the cost. If I get it wrong regularly, am I gonna stop being listened to? That's a potential problem with getting it wrong. But I also wanna counter that against, well, what if I, had a missed call. What if I was supposed to see this and I didn't? Is it cataclysmic? You know, are, is a mil are a million people going to die as did with COVID, right? In the United States, a million people died, many more globally. All right, if, if I get it wrong and we're not prepared, those consequences could be huge. And that kind of warps human behavior um, in a way where we're gonna try to avoid those missed calls and pull the alarm way more frequently than we might if that missed call consequence is huge. If the false alarm consequence is huge, uh, we may be really hesitant to do that. I remember when I was lifeguarding, um, we had emergency procedures. And if somebody hit their head and said, you know, I'm feeling tingly, like that was it. We initiated emergency procedure, we cleared the pool, we called the ambulance, it was all in effect. Um, it was a big deal. And so there was maybe a hesitance to make that call if there was any sort of uncertainty because making that call uh, was such a, a big consequence. All this is to say that when we're thinking about how we navigate our predictions, there are sometimes incentives to err one way or another that are based on the consequences we face in the world that have very little to do with what Tetlock is talking about here, where he's talking about, are we calibrated, right? Are we getting our, our probabilities right? Or are we getting it, it correct every time? Well, there may be reasons why human beings in assessing those other things and, and thinking about their judgment might actually choose to be wrong based on the consequences of their actions.